Thank you all for joining us for the first six Howard Mathematica New Frontiers in Research and Technology panel. This initial gathering will focus on the future of research and equity in the metaverse. Our panelists for this discussion are Dr. Andre Brock, Dr. Courtney D. Cogburn, Dr. Kyla McMullen, and Dr. Danielle Olson. You are about to hear the pre-tape lecture of one of our panelists. Thank you all for joining us for our six Howard Mathematica panel discussion with Danielle Olson. I'll begin by introducing our speaker. We'll close with a few resources for you to get to know six Howard Mathematica if you're joining us for the first time. Dr. Danielle M. Olson is an AI ML human factors researcher at Apple based in Seattle, Washington. She leads research to better understand the infinite ways human experiences with technologies can vary so that she can advocate for humans throughout the design and development of machine learning powered products. Prior to Apple, Dr. Olson earned her doctoral, master's, and bachelor's degrees in electrical engineering and computer science from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. As a graduate student at the MIT Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, she was part of the Human Computer Interaction Community of Research and advised by Professor D. Box Harrell, PhD, who directs the MIT Center for Advanced Virtuality. Welcome, Danielle. The floor is yours. Hi, everybody, and thank you so much to the organizers of the Summer Institute in Computational Social Science at Howard University for inviting me to present my work. Um, as uh, was already said, my name is Danielle Olson, and I'm an AIML Human Factors Researcher at Apple based here in Seattle, Washington. And today I'm not going to be presenting about the work that I'm currently doing at Apple, but rather I'm really excited to share with you the research I completed um, at MIT CSAIL for my dissertation which is entitled Social Modeling and Computational Simulations, Racial and Ethnic Identity Representation in Video Games and Virtual Reality Systems. Before I get started, I wanna just first acknowledge and thank the faculty members in my dissertation committee who are essential to both my graduate school journey as well as this research. So my research advisor, Professor Fox Farrell, Professors Daniel Jackson and Arvin Satyanarayan from MIT, and Dr. Rihanna Elise Anderson from the University of Michigan. So the focus of my talk today will be on the research I completed for my dissertation. And so I'm gonna first begin by introducing the vision and motivation for the work uh, and the two primary research questions that I investigated. I'll establish a few fundamental concepts from the fields of computer science and social science. And next I'm gonna go into the design and implementation of an interactive narrative video game system called Passage Home. In terms of my primary research findings, uh, first I'm gonna summarize the methodology I used for a user study I conducted with Passage Home, followed by a selected set of study findings with recommendations for how they might be applied. So thinking about the practical aspect of the six program, this is where I would love to hear your ideas and thoughts about how my work can practically fit into yours. And then second, I'm gonna present my novel design framework for racial and ethnic identity representation and simulations. I'll discuss the framework's high-level goals and structure, share a few examples of the proposed design strategies, and then conclude with a set of actionable steps for practitioners like yourselves. Lastly, I'm going to conclude by setting a research agenda for future work that I hope to see scholars like you all uh, work on in the future. And then, of course, I look forward to meeting you all virtually uh, in, a, in a month to talk more uh, together. So without further ado, I'm gonna begin by introducing the vision and motivation of the work, uh, establish some fundamental concepts um, from the fields that I applied uh, to this research. Video games or virtual reality systems are increasingly being used beyond entertainment in classrooms, workplaces, clinical settings, and more. And within these systems, race and ethnicity are already widely represented. However, as a computer scientist, I noticed that in these systems, designs and user, user experiences, games in VR uh, represent race and ethnicity in pretty rudimentary ways. Upon further investigation, I found that these representations have profound social impacts on users and important opportunities for both research and human computer interaction, which I'm now gonna refer to as HCI throughout the talk, and anti-racism efforts through better system design. In order to understand what would constitute a better system design, however, I needed to first understand, one, the current underlying representations and user experiences of race and ethnicity in these systems, 
two, stronger conceptions of race and ethnicity that are amenable to computational implementation, and third, more expressive and nuanced computational approaches with high utility for purposes such as research, learning, and social impact. I'm going to go in depth on each of these throughout today's talk. So let's start first with the existing uh, state of representations. Systematic analysis of racial and ethnic identity uh, representations uh, by critical media scholars over the last two decades have revealed frequent use of the following approaches. So first, race and ethnicity are typically represented as basic graphical models. For example, these aspects of identity are represented solely by customizing the skin color, hair texture, or facial features of an avatar. And although impressive strides have been made in the fields of computer graphics to create more realistic renderings of people, this is an extremely simplistic approach within racial and ethnic groups, um, because we know within these groups there's a substantial um, amount of diversity of visual traits. And furthermore, race and ethnicity are tied to more complex social processes and interactions than simply our appearance alone. And to be clear, these are not just issues in popular entertainment games, but also in cutting edge HCI research too. So leading VR and simulation researchers in the field often rely on study methodologies, which simply place users in a black virtual body, for instance, uh, simply represented by the appearance of the avatar and nothing else for racial perspective taking research. And additionally, the study results are typically categorized just by uh, dividing uh, by demography. So just comparing the results of white participants versus black participants and assuming this demographic category alone is sufficient for, for qualitatively explaining differences in outcomes. And second, race and ethnicity are often tied to immutable identity attributes at the code level that align with harmful racial stereotypes. Let's illustrate this with an example. The Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion is an extremely popular open world action role playing video game with 10 playable races that have predetermined attributes. This slide shows a screenshot from the game's documentation with information about two human races portrayed in this game. The quote, dark skinned red guards are described as born to battle, have 20 points greater strength and 20 points less intelligence and willpower than the Bretons who quote, are pale skinned and considered an intelligent race with proficiency and abstract thinking. By tying phenotypically based racial categories to these immutable attributes, this representation employs a philosophy, the philosophy of racial essentialism or the belief that racial races are biologically distinct groups with defining core essences. And this approach may lead to pitfalls such as reinforcing negative stereotypes. So you might wonder, why do these kinds of VR representations and video game representations matter? Well, beyond being simplistic, technical, and creative approaches, a wealth of research has demonstrated the impact of these representations on real world outcomes. People live up or down to them, both within simulations and when they step out of them. For instance, they can impact academic outcomes. A 2019 study found that sexist behavior in a virtual math classroom worsened the performance of learning outcomes of female students. They can have impacts on social behaviors. A 2013 study with a VR game that gave participants superpowers in the virtual environment led to increased altruistic behaviors in the physical world after the experience ended. They can impact racial attitudes. A 2009 study with a VR interview simulation found that participants who were assigned Black avatars demonstrated great, greater implicit racial bias towards Black individuals after the experience ended. And they can impact healthcare outcomes. A 2019 study found that a virtual perspective taking intervention uh, for physician residents that used a live simulation video game resulted in improved patient care for physician residents who previously demonstrated bias, discomfort, and anxiety in prescribing pain medication to black, black patients. So to summarize, race and ethnicity are already widely represented in computational media. Second, these representations are often overly simplistic and stereotypical. And third, they affect important psychosocial and performance related outcomes. So with these motivations in mind, my dissertation sought to answer two primary research questions. First, I wanted to better understand how people's ways of thinking about race and ethnicity in the physical world affected how they experience a simulation of racial discrimination in a virtual world. So my first research question asked, what are the interrelationships between our physical world, racial, ethnic socialization, attitudes and identity development, and our choices 
interpretations and experiences within Passage Home, which is a virtual simulation of racial discrimination that was developed as part of this work. The development and study of Passage Home also provided an opportunity to implement and evaluate a novel racial and ethnic identity model that addresses some of the limitations I previously discussed. And secondly, I wanted to apply empirical social science research on how people have been socialized to think about race to help practitioners create more nuanced and expressive re representations. So my second research question asked, how can racial and ethnic socialization strategies be operationalized to represent race and ethnicity in simulations? Um, I'm gonna talk about some primary contributions that I made to answer these questions. So first I created a novel simulation called Passage Home that embeds this improved identity model and can be used for many applications such as a research test bed for clinical interventions, uh, interventions for youth and educators, uh, workplace training, or a tool to enhance both serious and impact games as well as commercial games. And second, I contributed new empirical HCI research uh, from user studies I conducted using the system with 110 pre-K through 12 educators and 60 youth across the US. Not included today is the fact that I also studied the use of the system in Norway to understand um, how it could be flexible enough to extend to different cultural contexts. Um, and then third, uh, I contribute a novel design framework that makes concepts about how individuals are socialized to think about race and ethnicity amenable to implementation as components in these simulations. And to my knowledge, to the knowledge of my uh, faculty members, this is a completely novel contribution to the field of HCI by being the only research of its kind to one, utilize a framework of a racially specific stress and coping theory to simulate racial identity phenomena, and two, to examine individuals' behavior and experiences in these simulations through the lens of their socialization, ethnic identity development, and colorblind racial attitudes, which are terms I'm gonna define soon. So let's proceed to review a few fundamental topics from the theoretical framework. So I'll first briefly discuss some uh, topics from the field of computer science, primarily cognition of virtual identity and AI and interactive narratives. And then I'm gonna talk about some key social science theories, which are racial and ethnic socialization, which I keep mentioning, as well as the racial encounter, coping appraisal and socialization theory. And both of these were computationally implemented as models embedded in Passage Home, guide, guided the user study research and were used to inform the design framework. All right, so let's begin by talking about characters portrayed in virtual worlds that make up the metaverse, which is the focus of this workshop. Players often project aspects of their physical world identities onto their virtual identities with, within serious and impact games, as well as games for entertainment or fun. Um, and so my research advisor, digital media and artificial intelligence scholar, Dr. Fox Harrell, introduced this concept of blended identity to describe this blending of physical world and virtual world characteristics. He drew upon the work of cognitive computer and learning scientists. Um, so players' physical world, racial and ethnic identity is one of many different characteristics that they might project onto their virtual identity. And this specific projection is what my user study sought to better understand uh, with nuance. All right, in terms of AI and interactive narrative technologies, um, Interactive narratives describe experiences which seek to immerse users in a virtual world such that they might believe that they are an integral part of an unfolding story and that their actions have meaningful consequences on what happens. My work specifically focused on novel techniques for player modeling, which learns about individual differences between users and adapts the system responses and behavior based on those observations. And this can be achieved in many different ways. It can be captured explicitly by eliciting structured feedback, like asking the player to answer some survey questions or making selections and using that to scaffold a player model. But it also can be done implicitly by mapping players' behaviors and actions into abstractions that make up the player model. And they may be aware or unaware of this happening over time. These player models can then be used to personalize interactive narrative experiences. All right, so I'm gonna transition now to discussing those social science concepts and theories that inform the research. Um, so I just sought to develop a narrative engine and player identity model by mapping concepts from a social psychology theory called 
racial and ethnic socialization, which I'm now going to refer to as RES throughout my talk. RES is described as the process by which children acquire beliefs, values, and behaviors regarding how they think about race and ethnicity in society. It's a process that all individuals from all racial and ethnic backgrounds experience. It includes both direct and explicit messages, as well as indirect and implicit messages. So it happens regardless of whether or not your caregivers talk to you about race. And it comes from a variety of sources, including caregivers, teachers, one's neighborhood, and the media. And that media includes simulations like video games and VR systems, which are very powerful socializing agents. Empirical research has identified four themes that are most frequently used by families in the US for RES, which I'm gonna now define. So first is colorblindness and egalitarianism. This is a strategy that seeks to promote equality by avoiding mentions, all mentions of race, privilege, and structural inequity in discussions. Second is cultural pride and legacy reinforcement, which seeks to promote a positive racial and ethnic identity in children by teaching them about their racial history and legacy. Third is alertness to discrimination. It's a practice that seeks to make children aware of racial discrimination and related barriers in society. And fourth is promotion of mistrust. This is a practice that teaches children to be wary and cautious of those outside their racial or ethnic group. The user study gathered data on which of these four RES categories uh, and practices that participants were socialized with by their primary caregivers. And additionally, these four themes were used in the design framework. And um, just to be clear on RES, it, most people experience multiple strategies while growing up and, and may have a primary strategy, but oftentimes we receive many different kinds of messages from different age, socializing agents. The second primary theory used in my research is called the racial encounter, coping, appraisal, and socialization theory, which is a mouthful, so I'm going to now refer to it as RECAST throughout the talk. RECAST was developed by nationally recognized clinical psychologists and researchers, Dr. Howard C. Stevenson and Dr. Rihanna Elise Anderson, who's a faculty member on my committee. It provides a model based on empirical research about African-American families' racial socialization patterns, proposing that racial socialization buffers the negative influence between racial stress and racial coping by bolstering racial encounter self-efficacy or one's confidence. In the next part of my talk, I'm going to specifically review how the underlying narrative engine and passage home was developed in alignment with the step-by-step -step model proposed by Recast. All right, so now let's transition to a discussion of Passage Home. Um, I'm going to describe the system design process and a little bit about the architecture. Passage Home was designed and developed through a multi-year design collaboration between the MIT Center for Advanced Virtuality, directed by Professor Fox Farrell, and the University of Michigan Engaging, Managing, and Bonding Through Race, or Embrace Intervention, which is directed by Dr. Anderson. Embrace is a family-based racial socialization intervention designed to reduce stress, and improve family well-being and adolescent academic engagement. Embrace uses a variety of evidence-based clinical practices, including therapeutic role-playing exercises. So Passage Home was developed to support the therapeutic role-playing process in a way that provided one, high immersion in the story world compared to using paper scripts in the existing environment. Um, so as you can see on the photo in the left, uh, that, that, that was the uh, strategy that was used in the past is that they were using uh, scripts role playing in the physical world in that way, uh, which was very effective. Um, we just thought technology could aid in this uh, in these ways. Two, uh, it provided a greater level of control and repeatability to enable assessment of the interventions efficacy for behavior change. And three, it's a greater, greater level of efficiency for clinicians and researchers, you know, with high expertise to capture and analyze participant behavior. So by freeing up some of their resources and time, which is already, you know, they have so many things happening um, by automating this process, we hope that they can redirect some of their expertise towards serving um, uh, the, the folks that are in these programs. Um, so this video that's playing just shows a clip from the Passage Home Simulation. Um, and happy to provide this offline as well as provide a uh, text description of the video. Um, but it basically shows the interaction of the user 
uh, their, their avatar of this high school student who's black walking up to her teacher who's a white woman, um, basically who has accused her of plagiarizing an important essay. And you playing as the student have to kind of appraise and respond to uh, this. So uh, in summary, Passage Home instantiates these theories to simulate a discriminatory racial encounter. So a black student named Tiffany is confronted by racially charged accusations of plagiarism by her teacher who believes that black students are not capable of producing high quality writing. There is a ground truth, which is that the student did not cheat and is being discriminated against based on her race. So we do inform the player that you did not cheat on this essay, you worked very hard, it's your original work. So that is the ground truth. And then um, there are racially charged kind of comments that come from the teacher over time. Um, this ground truth enabled assessment of how the player appraised the various evidence that the accusation was indeed racially motivated. Um, so let's move on to the next slide. So I'm going to just review the basic architecture of the system, and we can go into as much detail during uh, the, the panel as uh, folks are interested. But first, players' inputs are mapped to a racial and ethnic identity model. And then secondly, this identity model is used by our narrative engine to update the game state. Uh, and third, game state is presented as audio and visual output to the player. For example, what the characters in the scene are doing, what they're saying, what choices they're presented with. And I wanna highlight that the system has a flexible architecture, which makes it very possible and easy actually to specify a new story description with different scenes, characters and objects, but uses the same underlying identity model and narrative engine. And we did actually demonstrate that flexibility by partnering with the middle school in Norway um, to update the, the names of the characters, the scene of the, the story, uh, to be in the Norwegian context and explore these issues there. So uh, that was a very interesting experience. All right, so with this foundation established, I'm gonna now transition to the heart of this talk, which is discussing the research that I did to answer research question uh, one. So I'll describe the methodology we used uh, in the user studies, and then I'm gonna share an important set of study findings with their implications and recommendations. So initially we pa developed Passage Home as a mobile virtual reality experience. Um, we were planning to run multiple user studies and lab settings across the US beginning in March of 2020. So as you can imagine, in spite of the resources that had been invested into planning and scheduling these studies and partnerships, all of the travel plans were uh, canceled due to COVID safety precautions with good reason. And I'd imagine some of you in the audience today can relate to some of the challenges of conducting research amidst a global health crisis uh, and being safe uh, in the process of generating creative alternatives to adapt this research. Before I move on, I just want to highlight like the reason we use mobile VR, because some folks, you know, often with good reason, call out some of the drawbacks like motion sickness being more, um, you know, a, a apparent or, or problematic. Um, but this was due to this being a low cost intervention. So uh, typically, at least in terms of those we surveyed, participants have access to mobile phones and these a plastic or cardboard head mounted displays that you can insert a phone into tend to cost less than $20 a piece. So that really enables this to be a scalable uh, intervention rather than investing in a multiple, multiple hundred dollar uh, headset that oftentimes takes a lot more setup time um, than something like this. And this also enables us to rapidly update the uh, VR a game and then push those updates to an app. Um, so it's really easy to do. I worked to quickly adapt the game to a web browser-based format and built an end-to-end -end website that guided participants through the study protocol using video and text. And these extraordinary circumstances ultimately became an opportunity to expand my investigation in two ways. So first I was able to broaden the participant population nationally rather than just the originally planned study sites. And second, I was able to study multiple visual formats of Passage Home just beyond the mobile VR version. So specifically, in addition to adapting the VR experience to a web uh, browser-based game with graphics, I also built an interactive hypertext version of the game using Twine, uh, which is an open source tool, very easy to use. Um, happy to chat more about that. And as a result, my user study findings have implications for multiple simulation formats. And I won't talk about that much today, but also have, you can refer to my dissertation. I can chat about that during the panel. 
And I want to note that since the game involves the topic of race and identity, it's important to note that the player was informed about the racial identities of all the characters in both versions of the game. So they weren't left to their own devices to just infer um, or, or assume race uh, based on like what they saw in either format. We explicitly informed that of them of the identities of the student, the teacher, the other staff at the school, and these other fictitious uh, peers. So in 2020, I conducted two national unmoderated user studies at scale with 110 pre-K through 12 educators and 60 youth ages 10 to 18. I'm going to now describe that study methodology. So first, following participant recruitment, I electronically obtained informed consent and then assent from youth, and each participant was randomly assigned to play either the graphics or hypertext condition of the game. Next, each participant was directed to a study website where they watched a video about the basic game mechanics, study instructions, and they uh, played through the game once. And as I mentioned, Passage Home is also a research test bed that captured all of the choices that they made during the game. After game completion, the participant was directed to an online survey with multiple game and identity related assessments. And then following data collection, I conducted mixed methods data analysis to identify interrelationships between participants' racial and ethnic identities and game outcomes. So this included chi-square analysis of variance, Pearson's correlations, and other descriptive statistics, in addition to coding the qualitative text responses to identify emergent themes. And now I want to review the study instruments that were used in the post game survey. Um, this is important because uh, all of the findings that I talk about today are going to be in terms of these assessments. Highly recommend checking that out if you're more interested in, in what the questionnaires look like. But five instruments were used to assess the game experience. So first, every choice players made in the game was captured. Second, the game experience questionnaire or GEQ was used to assess things like players immersion, emotions and behavioral involvement in the game. Third, we had a survey on player avatar relationship. So how much did players identify with their character? Fourth, we um, created a custom narrative interpretation survey. So they were answering questions indicating how they interpreted what was happening in the game, what, what the story meant. And then lastly, we had a qualitative survey, which captured information about players' strategies to play the game, their emotions during it, their interpretations of what, what they made of um, what happened, and, and that provided us with important context for the quantitative results. Okay, in terms of players' racial and ethnic identity development, we used four assessments that were validated instruments in the social sciences. So first, Players' racial and ethnic socialization, or how they were taught to think about race while growing up, was captured as a question during gameplay. Uh, so we did kind of an explicit uh, player scaffolding approach there. Second, the multi-ethnic identity measure, or MEME, is a validated instrument that was used to assess and produce numeric scores for two factors. So first is a commitment factor, which indicates how much somebody feels affirmation and belonging to their ethnic group. And second is an exploration factor, which indicates how much the participant has invested in learning more about their ethnic group. Third, we use the colorblind racial attitude scale, uh, which is a validated instrument designed for adults that was used only in the educator study group, which is the adult group, uh, to assess and produce numeric scores across three factors. First is unawareness of racial privilege, which are the social, political, and economic advantages that benefit white people. Second is unawareness of institutional discrimination, which are implications and in institutional forms of racial discrimination. And third is unawareness of blatant racial issues, which are just general pervasive racial issues in society. So these scores, higher scores indicate higher levels of unawareness of these issues. And then finally, a selected set of questions from the racial encounter appraisal and decisioning scale youth uh, was used only in the youth study. Uh, to assess how confident youth felt about their ability to appraise and cope with racial stress. All right, so for today's talk, I'm going to focus on three categories of findings for the studies, which answer the following questions. How did players' RES affect their game outcomes? How did players' ethnic identity development affect their game outcomes? And then what were some of the emergent qualitative response patterns? Um, and I just want to say, as, aside from these findings, I obtained a lot of other insights. So definitely check out the dissertation and um, to ask during the panel uh, to, to learn more about those. 
So let's begin with how players racial and ethnic socialization affected their game outcomes. So I conducted one way analysis of variance tests, which revealed statistically significant differences in game experiences and narrative interpretations between players with different primary RES experiences growing up. So what, what does this mean for implications for practitioners like yourselves? Well, I believe that when designing anti-bias simulation interventions, developers should consider that an individual's socialization may affect their overall game experience and hinder or assist them in correctly recognizing certain events as being racial in nature. For example, if an individual has not been socialized to be alert to discrimination, they might have a lot of difficulty picking up on more subtle forms of racism like those featured in Passage Home. Um, and here are a couple of examples of how you could apply this. So one, you could embed interactions that support coping and emotional processing for those who are alert to discrimination, given that socialization was linked to player affect. So some of those difficult emotions that might arise, how might you build in ways of processing that are backed by you know, research on this into your, your simulation? Or two, uh, simulation developers could inform explicitly those with more colorblind socialization experiences about fundamentals related to racism and discrimination that they might lack compared to their uh, other players with other socialization experiences. So there are games that I've seen as examples that I talk about in my dissertation, which do provide, you know, fundamental information, context, even vocabulary on these topics so you can learn as you play. Let's move on to how players' ethnic identity development affected their game outcomes. So the findings indicated that one, players with higher ethnic identity development had more favorable game experience outcomes, such as higher competence, immersion, and lower negative affect. And second, in terms of narrative interpretations, players with higher ethnic identity development were able, better able to correctly appraise the racial nature of the interactions in the game. So, uh, players' ethnic identity development should be taken into account when designing educational interventions using such systems, given its, their effects on game experiences and narr narrative interpretations. One of my no most notable findings was a moderate yet significant correlation between participants' commitment scores and their level of empathy towards the teacher, the teacher who was making these racially charged accusations. So this was only the case in the educator study in which the majority of participants were white women, which is the same identity group as the teacher in the game. And this is really important to note as it suggests that a higher ethnic identity commitment could be counterproductive toward in interventions which use perspective taking to increase empathy towards targets of racial discrimination rather than those who perpetrate them. So that could be working against you in, in these uh, interventions. And here are a couple of examples of how the findings could be applied to system design. Um, so one, you could inform those uh, with lower ethnic identity development about historical and present day issues affecting marginalized racial and ethnic groups. Um, and sorry for the overlap. <laughs> um, second, you could develop player modeling techniques which adapt skill level and challenge level based on players level of ethnic identity development. So on this slide, I kind of want to show like what this would look like in practice. So Game and simulation de designers desire to create experiences that put players in a state of flow. And being in flow means you're in the zone, which is a mental uh, state at the intersection of being at a high perceived skill level and challenge level. Um, and in the user study, I found that players with lower ethnic identity development uh, levels had higher levels of tension and negative affect in the game. In this flow diagram, this corresponds to a state which the challenge level is higher and the player's perceived skill level, level is lower. Um, so developers could use this information to shift the challenge level for players with lower ethnic identity development, resulting in a more favorable mental state. So again, some of those strategies I mentioned in the last slide with racial socialization might be used here to aid or assist players um, so that they feel like the, the skill level um, is, is shifted. I'm gonna now share a bit on the emergent patterns and participants' qualitative responses. So through qualitative data analysis, 12 recurring themes were identified that emerge across both the educator and youth studies. The figure on the right provides a visualization, very subjective, but <laughs> to demonstrate some of the you know, range of narrative interpretations that participants had. Um, these ranged in from lacking awareness or being aware of the racial, racial racially discriminatory nature of the encounter 
and from internalizing or externalizing uh, what happened. I've chosen three specific themes highlighted by these yellow boxes associated with responses that I thought were very interesting to unpack together today. Um, they indicated a lack of awareness of the racial nature of the interactions, um, and they're really important opportunities that should be addressed through simulation design, I believe. So the first theme I'm going to review today emerged from a response uh, responses that indicated participants were oblivious to covert forms of racial discrimination. So these kinds of responses mentioned race as a possible factor, but mentioned a lack of overt racism, resulting in their lack of confidence in their appraisal. So the first quote comes from a 17-year-old Latina female student in the 11th grade, insisting that because the teacher never mentioned anything explicitly about the student's race, it couldn't be called racial discrimination. And the second quote comes from a 31-year-old African-American male educator who felt that the story didn't provide enough proof of racism. He also chose to mention that based on his experience in real life, quote, students will always try to cheat on assignments. It could be interpreted that he felt that the teacher's accusations were justified because of this. And in both of these responses, although these participants both come from minoritized racial and ethnic groups, they lack the ability to correctly pick up on these subtle forms of discrimination. The second theme I want to review today emerged from responses that denied, minimized, or did not pick up on any cues uh, leading to the possibility that racism motivated the teacher's accusations. So a subset of these responses uh, contained vehement and defensive remarks, uh, rejecting any possibility uh, about the interaction being about race. And uh, the first quote comes from an 11 year old Asian male student in the fifth grade, who in response to the very mention that the student was treated unfairly due to her race, expressed in all caps, quote, those are bad thoughts, racist thoughts. Uh, and then some of these responses did, did acknowledge the racial nature of the remarks, but minimized them or described their perception of a post-racial United States. So this second quote comes from a 33-year-old white male teacher, who although he indicated he had been socialized to be aware of discrimination, expressed sort of this colorblind or egalitarian attitude in his own teaching practices. So he, he described a feeling of being forced by passage home system options to force to focus on race being the issue. And the third and final theme I'm, I'm going to review today emerged from those who internalize or assign self-blame to the student or describe the student from a deficit orientation. So some players generated new ideas or backstories to justify the teacher's behavior. So this quote comes from a 41-year-old African-American male teacher who, in spite of the video game explicitly informing users about the student being extremely talented, high achiever, attributed the teacher's accusations to her being not up to the standards of her new all white magnet school. This participant reported being socialized with colorblindness while growing up, and he had higher level, uh, higher than average uh, unawareness of racial privilege scores than the other participants in the study, and lower than average ethnic identity development uh, scores compared to the overall educator group. So, First, these qualitative findings suggest that racial or ethnic group alone is insufficient for explaining participants' appraisals of simulations and racial discrimination. Without attending to differences in the factors that I mentioned in these studies, responses from racial or ethnic minority participants who incorrectly appraise a simulation might remain latent or considered anomalies. Uh, second, RES and other factors I I'd studied could provide helpful or missing context to these kinds of findings. Uh, third, developers should seek to proactively address alternative explanations that players might generate to justify or minimize racism. And lastly, developers should be aware that some individuals may be completely unaware that subtler forms of racism exist, and some individuals may feel resistance to the mention of race at all. All right, so let's move on to talking about research question two or the design framework that I mentioned. So building on Harrell's blended identity model, the findings from the user studies that I just finished discussing demonstrate the significant ways that players project their racial attitudes and identities from the physical world into simulation environments. And in reverse, so simulations are also powerful socializing agents, which might influence individuals who use these systems to acquire beliefs, attitudes, and behaviors related to race and ethnicity. So designers and developers of these systems embed their values and ideologies into these technical systems. So given that simulations are sites of socialization, the novel design framework provides a critical reflection tool for one, exposing the RES practices being communicated by simulation designs, 
And two, it generates new simulation designs by using the RES practices developers desire to use. So it's structured by mapping each of the four dominant RES practices I described earlier onto four categories of simulation components. So first is simulation environments like audio, visuals, maps, spatial layouts, and more. Second is player characters, which are the characters you, like you as the player directly control in a simulation. Non-player characters are NPCs, which are the characters controlled by the system, not the player. And lastly, the content structure, which includes mechanics, rules, narratives, achievement systems, et cetera. Um, so using a critical HCI perspective in my user study findings, I've divided the four most prevalent RES practices in the US into two categories as they pertain to representations and simulation. So the first category of design strategies use RES practices that I feel reinforce issues with existing representations, uh, which hi were highlighted at the beginning of my talk. And the second category of strategies use RES practices, which help to address these issues and move the needle towards simulations being a helpful tool for positive cultural resistance. So let's begin with the two practices that reinforce, reinforce existing issues with examples of each. First, design strategies which use cultural endorsement of the mainstream are associated with simulations that reflect or reinforce the mainstream or dominant culture. For instance, in Call of Duty Modern Warfare, which is an extremely popular first-person shooter game, there's a lack of cultural accuracy in environmental visuals associated with geographic context. This image shows a screenshot from the game in which the letters do not link properly on a poster displaying Arabic text. Game critics have also pointed out that the game features a map of Karachi that inaccurately has signs both in, uh, in both Urdu, which is Pakistan's official language, and Arabic. These are examples of how cultural assets can be appropriated for use of in backdrop, as backdrops in games without attention to cultural specificity or accuracy, reinforcing mainstream viewpoints which fail to distinguish unique cultures and kind of homogenize them. Second, design strategies which use promotion of mistrust signal caution and wariness about other racial ethnic groups through simulation components. For example, in Street Fighter II, which is a well-known Japanese fighting video game franchise, two player characters, Ken and Ryu, return in later versions of the game uh, to two all evil alter egos, Violent Ken and Evil Ryo. In this game, the characters appear as darker skinned versions of their original forms, as shown in the before and after images on the slide. Evil characters portrayed with dark skin is a frequent trope in video games and other media that reinforce colorism, which is why you know, society teaches people to see lighter skin as good and darker skin as bad, regardless of race. And this is tied to racism. This is an example of design strategies which promote distrust towards racial or ethnic groups who might have darker skin tones. Let's move on to the two RES practices, which can be used to address issues with mainstream representations. So when applied to simulation design, alertness to discrimination and preparation for bias reflect the developer's awareness of racism and racial barriers in the physical world. A Thousand Cut Journey is an immersive VR experience created by researchers at Columbia University and Stanford that put players in the perspective of a Black man named Michael Sterling during several, several encounters of racism in childhood, adolescence, and adulthood. Dr. Courtney Cogburn, the lead creator of this work, described a possible narrative thread during the scene where the player encounters two police officers. If you look down in their face or don't follow their instructions to get down on your knees and put your hands up, then the officers could become more aggressive. This personalization of the non-player character behavior demonstrates this practice, reflecting an awareness of and possibly providing users with preparation for the power dynamics that Black Americans grapple with when responding assertively during encounters with police and law enforcement. And I'm sure Dr. Cogburn will educate me and all of us much more on this work as well as other work that she's done. All right, lastly, when used as a design practice, cultural pride and legacy appreciation, which help, uh, helps to aid in the transmission of cultural values, knowledge, and practices through the simulation. Never Alone is a puzzle platformer world game. It was developed in collaboration between game makers with nearly 40 Alaska Native storytellers community members and elders who contributed to the development of the game. Never Alone explores the traditional lore of the Inupiat people through gameplay. 
The stories in the game are narrated by a master storyteller in their spoken language. And it was only through direct collaboration and with and leadership from individuals within this group portrayed in the game such that, th that this compelling and positively received experience could have been created. Given our limited time together, I was only able to review one example of each of the four RES practices and how they could be applied to each of those four simulation components we talked about, but you can refer to the design framework in chapter six of my dissertation to learn more about the full design framework shown in the image on this slide. The framework details a total of 16 novel design approaches for representing race and ethnicity in simulations. And each design approach is accompanied by a prompt for reflection, which is also translated into a prescriptive format with examples from existing system uh, and theorized consequences of these designs on the user. So I highly encourage you all to use this design framework in your own work, and I would love to learn more about um, both benefits as well as uh, challenges that you experience in practicing with this. So to conclude my discussion of this, I want to summarize three key recommendations named by this framework, which can be acted upon by developers and the industry at large. So the first is to hire, fairly compensate, and follow the lead of creators from the racial or ethnic groups portrayed in various simulations. Systematic analysis of these representations in popular video games have found that the percentages of characters across race and ethnicity do not correspond to the overall demographics of video game players or general population, but rather they tend to align with the demographics of industry video game developers themselves, which may be not surprising. Um, and so this lack of development team diversity and inclusion is a significant barrier to creating better representations. And I wanna call out that the SIX program is actively demonstrating this solution by helping to equip folks from our communities with the tools required to participate and lead the design of these systems, which is amazing. Uh, the second recommendation is for uh, developers to use credible information that comes from individuals within these communities. Um, many of the systems I identified through research for my framework development had uninformed and even harmful representations that were informed by inaccurate dominant conceptions and stereotypes. Working directly with communities who have, uh, you know, little to no representation in the games industry to tell their own stories would enable better self-representation. And the last is, um, you know, developers should be more intentional about how a simulation might reinforce or alternatively reimagine physical world racial barriers. A simulation might be a place where barriers could be ignored or reimagined for play, expression, or creativity. However, my studies found that participants who were highly unaware of racial issues emerge with some inaccurate, potentially harmful impressions about the student compared with the uh, the higher level of awareness of racial issues. Therefore, if not intentionally designed, participants might emerge from simulations with false impressions about the embodied and physical experiences of marginalized racial and ethnic group members. Um, so final part of today's uh, work, I just wanna share some concluding remarks. So uh, in conclusion, my research findings have broad implications for future development of simulations portraying race and ethnicity. So individuals bring their own racial socialization, ethnic identity development, and racial attitudes into virtual spaces. And these factors must be considered in the design process to truly tap into the expressive potential of these media forms. Social science models can be used to uh, used in the research and development of simulations to um, better you know, improve them. And based on my findings, this approach can lead to more expressive and nuanced approaches that have high utility for play, learning, research, and even social impact. And finally, simulations are powerful socializing agents that have impacts on individuals' concepts and ideologies about race and ethnicity. Developers must be conscious and intentional about the socialization practices that they employ during the design process and how they might impact users. So I just want to quickly thank the five organizations uh, shown on this slide who provided me with the financial sponsorship in the form of grants and fellowships to enable this research. And uh, this concludes my presentation. I look forward to meeting you all and discussing how this research might help support your ideas um, and work during the future of research and equity in the metaverse panel in June. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us, Danielle. I know our participants are looking forward to live Q&A with you and the other panelists during the Institute in June. See you all very soon. Thank you all for watching. For more information on SIX, 
Howard Mathematica, visit our website, follow us on social media, and join our email list.